hello, good afternoon. It's nice to see some, some familiar faces and some new folks. Uh, this is uh, Oregon Cyber Resiliency Summit uh, 2024. You are on the cyber physical track, whether you intended to be or not. And I'm uh, proud to introduce our first speaker on this track this afternoon, which is Aaron Boykin. Uh, Aaron is a data center specialist, system specialist at the University of Oregon, monitoring core data center infrastructure and cooling systems. He maintains building automation code and collaborates with vendors with extensive experience in component level repair and electronic systems. Please welcome Aaron. Hello. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not that nervous yet. Um, thank you guys for coming today. I'm presenting on cybersecurity and power generation and distribution. And I'm your presenter, Aaron Boykin. And I have with me a couple folks from eWeb that will be available for questions at the end. And I've also uh, thankfully gotten some collaboration from utilities and energy as well as um, WECC, or Western Electric Coordination Council, I believe I said that correct. Uh, we're going to go with it. I think that was right. Yeah, w w that's them for sure. Um, I have a couple points that I'd like to make with you guys today, uh, the overall theme of this presentation. Um, I'd like to uh, present the complexity that data center operators and utility operators face today. Uh, what impact outages have on society, as well as how past events have helped improve resiliency in utilities. Um, I'd also like to demonstrate the diverse equipment that helps produce and distribute power and information, as well as how challenging it is to monitor these systems, especially with aging equipment. Um, you'll see a theme reappear of the complexity and size of the facility and what different security threats are presented to those different entities. Starting from a historical lens, I'm just gonna make this make noise for a second. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch it. <laughs> hey Siri. Um, AI is listening. Um, <laughs> starting from a historical lens, I'd like to uh, kind of build up to where we are today. So looking at 1965, there was a northeast blackout. It impacted nine states for about 13 hours, and it was caused by misconfigured relays, and then it rerouted power, and then those relays, the other relays that existed, also tripped. It's considered the catalyst for generating standards and procedures and regulatory bodies that we have today, one of which is the electric power Research Institute, which is responsible for the research and development of monitoring and metering equipment that we still use today. And as I move on, you'll notice a theme of improper maintenance. Let me just scroll real quick. Uh, communication breakdown, weather-related stress that causes issues, as well as some current events help escalate these issues, whether they be political or other reasons. Uh, the initial cause and reaction is not always correct initially, but later when it's researched, people start to understand what the actual cause of these outages were. Some other honorable mentions are New York 1977, where a lightning storm caused an outage, and also some improperly maintained breakers came into that equation as well. It led to riots and looting, mostly due to political stress that was happening during that time in New York. Uh, West Coast 1982, there was a high wind storm that knocked down trees into power lines. Um, there was uh, two million people affected and communication system failures led operators to fail to execute backup plans as well. Uh, the Northwest had an outage in 1996 due to extreme heat that strained the power grid and due to voltage instabilities it led to a cascading failure that also affected about two million people. Many of these events have had multiple failure points that just happened to line up and cause the outage. You'll kind of see that as we continue. And the next event is really well covered by practical engineering. And I have an extra slide all the way at the end of the presentation as well as links hidden within this. So please feel free to download this from, I believe our website, the Oregon Re Cyber Resiliency. 
uh, specific link, and it was very heavily studied and understood and led to a lot of modern improvements, which is the Northeast blackout of 2003. It was the second largest blackout in history, impacting 45 to 55 million people. It impacted Northeast US and Ontario for an average of seven hours with some people being impacted multiple days. Uh, it was due to a monitoring and alerting system that went down and IT staff failed to communicate that to operators, so they were unaware of the issue. The other problem is that there's something called a MISO state estimator, which is responsible for providing um, operators with cross-regional -region information and trying to determine some of the what-ifs that lead to failures in utilities, and this was also not properly working that day. So they were unable to actually identify that there was an issue with the grid. Customers and plants started calling in reporting issues, but they were ignored because of the state of the monitoring system. And I'm gonna read an excerpt. Sorry, I moved away from the mic. Uh, I'll read an excerpt. Notice the new threat that gets called out, as well as the society's initial reaction and the breakdown of understanding that they originally had. On a warm day, First Energy's 345 kilovolt transmission line in Ohio dipped and made contact with some overgrown trees and faulted. By the way, I didn't explain this, but it dipped due to heat stress on the transmission line. An alarm system which should have alerted operators did not do so, so the high voltage bottlenecked and rerouted itself, causing other lines to sag into trees, leading to other faults. In the moment, many officials weren't sure what caused the blackout, one report blamed it on the Con Edison plant, or the fire at the Con Edison plant. Uh, others had ill-founded worries that it was a victim of a blaster computer worm. Still, others incorrectly pinned it on presumed nuclear plant outage in Pennsylvania. So recapping, there was a lack of communication from IT to operators, so they were unaware of that. The MISO state estimator system was down. Customers and plants were trying to issue warnings to the operators, but they were ignoring them due to the state of their other systems they were relying on, and they had no visibility. And there was a lack of maintenance in the form of overgrown trees and arguably the monitoring and alerting system that should have told them there was a problem. So what was the impact to society? There was busy circuits, boil water notices, Batteries and food shortages due to panic and refrigeration failure. People were trapped in subways. People slept outside due to the sweltering heat. Cell sites started to fail. TV stations started to fail. 265 power facilities were shut down this day, and at least 11 deaths were tied to this event, with some reporting up to 100 deaths were tied to this event. A couple years later, in 2005, more regulatory bodies were created. One of them was North American Electric Reliability Corp, or NERC. It covered US and Canada and could charge up to $1 million per day in fines for resiliency failure. NERC included things such as computer hackers, weather-related events, and general maintenance failure. Put a pen in computer hackers. We'll be coming back to that due to the event. Um, in the upper picture here, that. Hopefully you can see pretty well. I didn't actually, I can't see your angle of it, but they're huddled around a uh, battery powered radio because it was one of the only forms of information and news they could gather during this outage. Radio stations were some of the most resilient apparently. Um, the bridge is filled with people that are panicked thinking that it could be another terrorist attack with this being so close to 9-11. So that's kind of the impact it had on society. Just two years later, uh, it became clear the threat that computer hackers posed to national security. Idaho National Laboratories tested a cyber attack against physical infrastructure of the grid. By rapidly flipping the breaker on this generator, they were able to destroy the diesel engine. I'm gonna show you a clip of it real quick. Hopefully the sound will come through not too loudly because it's kind of annoying. And I'll try and narrate it for anyone with hard of hearing. You see some smoke, or hard of seeing? I don't know. Anyways, you see some smoke come out of the uh, 
coupler between them, and then the engine actually starts to emit some smoke, followed by the generator. And there's an outside view of what's going on, and it's billowing smoke out of the exhaust. And then you see some of the white gas emitting from the building that it's contained in. It's worth noting that supervisory control and data acquisition is the architecture used to control and monitor equipment in most utilities. Some refer to it as building automation control or industrial automation control. I'm going to just generically say SCADA because it kind of encompasses both as well as anything else that is relatively related to that. Um, it's comprised of a supervising computer that other sensors and subcomputers report up to. It also provides a human machine interface so that operators can actually engage in monitoring and controlling these systems, making adjustments. It's still used today and it's the basis of what this video is demonstrating as an attack vector. The scary part is that one of the cybersecurity tactics is obscurity because even if people are able to gain access to a SCADA system, they often don't know how to run the utilities behind it. So they usually are seen, and there's actually a mention of this in practical engineering, poking around in the HMI to try and find something they can change to damage the utility, but they don't know what they're doing in most cases. So attacks to SCADA still occur today, and they do not get much coverage due to the threat of national security. Uh, the Aurora generator tests focus primarily on generation side. Power systems can be visualized by these three main parts, generation and storage, transmission and distribution. Uh, you'll notice maybe if you can see it on the distribution side, there's mention of storage and there's also a picture of solar on the residential house there. And realistically, those are part of this equation and a cybersecurity threat as well. Um, Attack vectors exist in all of these, and operators are worried about anything from earthquakes to squirrels plus cybersecurity. So it's a lot to take in for a utility operator. Uh, when you realize there are also three main attack vectors in SCADA systems, uh, it starts to become clear how these threats are so impactful to the power grid and other utilities. False data injection is one example where you may change a set point value of what a pump pressure should be or a voltage on a line should be and you send that into an over voltage or over pressure scenario damaging equipment. Obstructing operators is another example so that the operators cannot actually see or monitor the equipment. They may not get alerting from the equipment or they're unable to control the equipment. And then attacking the state estimators like the MISA system that I mentioned earlier that looks at kind of larger regions. If you don't have a really clear idea of the health of the overall utility, how are you supposed to know there's a problem? So as we approach the modern day, data centers are increasingly becoming viewed as a utility. Utilities are more interconnected and interdependent on each other. Grid operators may be using a software platform that's hosted as a cloud platform in a data center. Uh, and data centers may be reliant on local grid operators to power their facility, including their backup systems. The impact outages have are determined by the longevity, current events, and the size of population affected. The outage that occurred earlier this year with CrowdStrike is a perfect example of the interconnectedness and dependencies between systems with flights being impacted, healthcare and telecommunications being impacted. It was considered the largest IT outage that we've faced. And it wasn't even a cyber criminal, it was just a coding error. So now that we have kind of started dabbling in data centers being a utility, what else makes them a utility? Well, they're responsible for monetary transactions, if you think about bank records, medical data, transportation systems, and cloud components supporting core business functions. They're reliant on the power grid, but have backup systems. These backup systems are a clue to the importance data centers play. Many can continue to operate after multi-day outages and have priority uh, refueling agreements with the locals. 
and power, power restoration agreements with the locals. They can serve as large internet hubs and cause multi-system failures and even have local or large-scale governmental outages. So the rest of this presentation is going to be focused on utilities as a whole, including data centers, electric, and anything else. Um, what kind of challenges do they focus, or what kind of challenges do they face? Um, utilities have expensive gear to maintain. They're in various financial situations. Luckily, most of the utilities do get enough money because of the national security threat, but that's not always true, so it's worth considering. Equipment might also need custom fabrication, which means it's expensive or may take months or years to replace. Engi an engineer may, needed, may be needed to reevaluate a modern day replacement or to change based on the load that the utility is facing. Uh, transformers, generators, and chillers are just some examples of these. And monitoring older equipment potentially exposes us to cybersecurity threats when you're thinking about operational technology. What concerns do utilities have? Well, the human part of it is kind of scary because there's social engineering, phishing, poor password management, and sharing of information that can allow an easy door in. Those are common topics covered in this event, but the point of it is that these SCADA systems have a human standing in between them that could allow them access. Summing up point two and three here, AI is generating significantly more heat load and high density computing is becoming more common in data centers. Uh, where we would have seen five kilowatts per rack, we're now starting to see 30 to 60 or maybe even up to 100 kilowatts just in one rack. And watts, electrically speaking, are defined as the amount of work that you can do with electricity. Thermodynamics defines that as the rate of heating. So when you put those together and think like a data center designer, that puts stress on the fact that whatever you put into that data center, you also have to extract in the form of heat. So you're not only demanding more power from a rack perspective, but a cooling perspective, and putting all that strain upstream into the utilities. There's also a shift to green energy production. When you start to think about the complexities and interdependencies that we're adding with that and everything else already described, it pushes engineering to its limits. Uh, it's very inviting for an attacker to have a higher financial or reputational impact on an organization. This engineering limit has led to some interesting things. And this next slide has my only joke, so if I don't get a pity laugh. <laughs> uh, Google started using treated sewage water to start cooling some of their data centers, for example. The question I pose is, with AI, higher density computing, um, and the extreme negative impact it has on a designing perspective all the way up to utilities, plus the stress of engineering and greenifying utilities, whether that be solar panels and other forms of energy and storage. Climate change is real, and I'm glad we're working on it, but I'm just trying to say that it adds steps and complexities that are more attack vectors for anyone to try and use to get into an organization. On top of that, SCADA networks are being proven to be a place of attack. Um, by the way, what would you call a cooling failure at this facility? Here's my joke, so be ready to laugh. Brownout. <laughs> Nailed it. So what challenges do utilities face today? Well, I've already talked about diversifying the energy portfolio. That's one of them. The reality is adding complexity, nodes, and cost. That's really what that comes down to. Another common topic that comes up is why not use AI to control these systems? It's uh, severely lacking maturity. <laughs> um, I got some laughs and it wasn't even a joke. That's perfect. Um, it's lacking the maturity that it needs in order to run something that has such a national security impact or a really societal impact with people. Um, and automated partners have expressed explicit concern around information injection in those AI models, 
where you may be able to manipulate the model to thinking something's okay, a normal parameter, and then it will just go about overpressurizing something or overvoltaging something or over overing something. I don't know. And the other thing to consider is the knowledge and learning validation of these models. We have no window in knowing how to tell what it is actually making a learning thing out of or what it's learned from what we've given it. So that lack of maturity is why it's not in utilities infrastructure, as, at least as far as a control mechanism. Um, the other considerations here are the investments that companies are having to make into cybersecurity software, which is kind of a false sense of security in the sense that they may be neglecting a line item for operational technology because it's so expensive, and this is just another added line item that they have to replace. Um, and multi-purpose facilities uh, stretch their resources even farther. For example, if you have a steam generation plant and maybe a cooling plant and maybe power and a data center all in the same facility, you have a lot of really expensive items to replace. Um, it's also just generally adding complexity to monitoring those systems as well as reacting to any sort of issues that you would have with them. Um, another consideration that I've heard from some folks is when doing the research for this is <laughs> facilities uh, being an attack vector for something larger. So like a smaller generation or distribution node that's maybe run by another company that they're just subbing out to, they become an attack vector for the larger part of the power grid, which would not be ideal. So what, can, uh, what have we learned to try and mitigate some of these things? Uh, link included, but you can sign up for CISA notifications and they email you way more than you want them to with cybersecurity threats. Um, and update your equipment, securing communication by encrypting traffic using non-default passwords. Don't know why I had to say that. Uh, putting devices on segmented networks, uh, multi-factor authentication to name a few. Physical security like personnel access, barricades and CCTV to name a few. Um, and as my supervisor put it, a big part of managing equipment life cycles is planning budget for refresh. Know and track the life cycles, advocate from a security perspective when it is part of a refresh. That helps you with administration side of the thing. Um, and establishing relationships with partners is really important. They'll maybe give you news about a zero day attack as well as just being there when you need them to be. Um, and stay connected with current events in the sense of a threat analysis. What that means is that if there's something going on in the news, whether it be politically or whatever driven, there's a really high chance that there is a chance, wow, I don't know why I said that, uh, that it will lead to an attack on your facility. So it's worth considering what's going on in the news so that you try to make sure that you understand the threats that are posed to your organization or utility. What can you do besides what was on the last slide? Overturn rocks, ask questions, strive to optimize, which means automate, discover, and practice scenarios and test workarounds, create healthy monitoring, plan heavily, document heavily, all of these leading to you finding gaps before they're found for you, and knowing how to react without causing further damage. Once an issue is found, determine and dis describe the impact to your organization. And lastly, as a common theme at these events, teamwork. Make sure you work as a team to identify issues. And I was supposed to have 10 minutes, but you get two minutes for questions. <laughs> oh, and eWeb's here. So th these guys are from the cybersecurity team, Brandon and Mark. Yes. Uh, so if you have any eWeb specific questions, they will give you a very vague version of the answer. Thank you. Apparently, I can't talk for more than this distance. Um, 
Yes, uh, NERC has re regulations called NERC SIP standards that regulate how uh, segregation of networks has to be. And depending on how much load you have uh, in your system, how many kilovolts you have across lines, how much you have in your system total, you have different tiers of compliance that you have to go to. eWeb is a part of that because we do generation and because we have partners that do generation. We are a part of that. And so, yes, we do do segregation. A uh, bit to add to that, um, really common theme with a lot of uh, utilities that we, they have that separation, that air gap network, but there's generally always some kind of jump host um, where uh, the SCADA system is communicated with um, from the IT side of the environment. And those jump hosts tend to be the most vulnerable uh, pieces of equipment across pretty much all utilities, SCADA networks, any kind of industrial controls that you'll find. Um, so pay attention to those, monitor the traffic that goes in and out of those kinds of jump posts that you're using to integrate. Uh, yeah. The other uh, big point of entry would be vendors uh, because vendors love to bring their laptops in to go take troubleshoot some issue and then they just take their laptop back out again and you don't know what antivirus they've got on their laptop if any at all. So there are having standards with your vendors and having contract language with your vendors saying, hey, we are going to break bring you on here to do this uh, X, Y, this. Here's our cybersecurity section of our contract. Can you meet these standards? Other questions? You got, you got a cybersecurity um, department or you got the IT department? Um, cybersecurity is actually not part of IT or our information services at, uh, at eWeb. We're actually separate. We're under business continuity um, because uh, business continuity, things go bang, and cybersecurity, things go bang occasionally. Uh, we try not to make them very common. Um, but sorry, you, you were saying how bad large? We're a department, but we're like not that many people. Yeah. Uh, part of being separate is it gives us um, uh, audit independence. Um, there's less of a conflict of interest between like what we're uh, monitoring for and the kinds of people that are actually doing the work. So that's it's nice to have that kind of separation administratively. Yeah. Any further questions? Or for Aaron. Thank you. And real quick, as a closing, uh, I just want to give special thanks to eWeb for collaborating on this, as well as uh, Western Electric Coordinating Commission Co Council. I don't know. Uh, close. Uh, Utilities and Energy here at University of Oregon actually helped with some of the answers to this as well. There was a bunch I didn't cover due to time. One area I would have liked to cover better is the distribution side of utilities. Um, it was actually something that you guys pointed out that you were more nervous about. Um, and anti-drone systems and a bunch more. There's a lot to consider, but I've included extra links at the end. So please, if you have any nerdiness about this presentation, make sure you download it and take a look at the videos I've included and links. <laughs>